Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Amazon Web Services Partner Webinar Series. Our topic today is Big Data Visual Analytics with MicroStrategy and Amazon EMR. I'm your host, Maya Cabassi, with the Partner Marketing Team here in Seattle. I'd like to start with a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, we, before uh, I introduce um, our presenters, know that this presentation is being recorded. And while your lines are muted, you can submit questions anytime during the presentation. Use the Q&A widget in your browser to do so. And we will take time for questions at the close of the webinar. Um, the presentation will be available on AWS YouTube channels. I'm pleased to be joined by Anurag Tandon, Director of Marketing, Big Data Analytics at MicroStrategy, along with Albert Wong, Reporting Platform Manager at Netflix. Also with us, John Ankoff, Senior Product Manager with Amazon Web Services. Today's agenda will cover Amazon Elastic MapReduce, Map EMR, MicroStrategy Business Intelligence Platform on AWS for modeling, reporting, and analyzing data, and a case study, how Netflix deploys MicroStrategy's Business Intelligence Software Platform on AWS. We will begin with John Einkoff, who will talk about Amazon EMR, followed by Anurag Tandon from MicroStrategy and Albert Wong from Netflix. We will wrap up with a Q&A. So without further delay, let me turn it over to John, Product Manager with Amazon Web Services. Take it away, John. Thank you, Maya. Uh, I'm going to give a brief introduction to Amazon Web Services, uh, followed by a brief introduction to Amazon Elastic MapReduce, which is the managed Hadoop service uh, offered by Amazon. So first of all, a quick introduction to AWS. Uh, AWS is a collection of flexible IT services uh, including compute, storage, and database, uh, but also including various networking services, uh, application augmentation services, and other uh, management services that you can use to, to manage and deploy your application. There's a variety of ways that companies and organizations use AWS. Uh, the three main ones are first to augment on-premise resources um, with capacity in the cloud, uh, second to migrate apps that are in a corporate data center onto the cloud, and thirdly, to, to build brand new applications, sites, services, and other uh, new greenfield lines of business uh, on the cloud. AWS has a global infrastructure. We're available in nine regions around the world and 25 availability zones. We are continuously expanding to new geographies. Um, one of the benefits of AWS is it allows you to go global in uh, literally a few minutes or a couple of clicks. Just an interesting fact um, about Amazon Web Services. So every day this year, we are adding enough server capacity to power all of Amazon.com's business when it was a $5 billion retailer back in 2003. Um, just to give you a sense of the scale that we are operating at now. It's uh, used by enterprises around the world in a variety of sectors, as well as a variety of government agencies and other educational and nonprofit institutions. And uh, we are consistently recognized as a leader in the cloud and uh, IT services space. Uh, I don't have a slide on this later, but uh, EMR is also consistently recognized as a leader in the Hadoop space uh, by Gartner, Forrester, and other analysts. One of the reasons that AWS has uh, gotten so much traction in the market and why it's so appealing for customers is that it's extremely reliable and it's uh, very low cost. I have some more data on this later, but. I uh, just wanted to share that there, there's a variety of third-party analysts that have studied uh, the cost and reliability of AWS and has concluded that it's one of the, the core benefits of moving into the cloud and specifically Amazon. So why, why do organizations, companies, nonprofits choose AWS? There's certainly a variety of options out there. So one of the reasons is that uh, our customers like paying for infrastructure when they need it and only paying for what they need. Uh, there's no upfront requirement. There's no money that you need to put down to get started. Uh, all you need is a credit card. Uh, secondly, because of Amazon's global scale, we are able to achieve very low cost uh, and very, very 
attractive economics, we pass along those low costs in the form of low prices and price reductions. Uh, so you'll see on the slide here, uh, we've announced 34 price reductions since, um, since AWS got started. Uh, it seems to me that uh, the number of price reductions has actually been accelerating over time uh, as our scale also accelerates. Uh, thirdly, if, if you compare the two charts on this slide, um, on the left, what you're looking at is the results of having on-premise infrastructure where occasionally you have waste because your infrastructure and your capacity is, is uh, not being fully utilized, uh, or you have customer dissatisfaction or user unhappiness uh, because you have more demand than you have capacity. Uh, conversely, on the right, the, the graph is meant to show that in the cloud and with AWS, uh, because you can very easily scale your applications and scale your capacity, you can very easily match capacity to demand uh, to eliminate that waste and to eliminate user dissatisfaction. Fourthly, and, and this is something that uh, is a little bit less obvious, I think, but by moving into the cloud and by deploying applications on AWS, you can innovate faster and experiment more often. So whereas uh, on-premise it can be very difficult to experiment, uh, failure is expensive, uh, and in general it, it can be hard to innovate with, with software and applications, on AWS you can experiment often, you can innovate quickly. If you fail, it is, it is cheap, um, especially in the big data space where you want to innovate and fail fast, fail cheaply. Uh, there, there's, really, there, there's really no, there's nothing better than being in the cloud where you can deploy, for example, a Hadoop cluster uh, try out an application or a new algorithm, and if it's not working, kill the cluster and, and start again. Uh, fifthly, uh, a lot of our customers appreciate that, that they do not need to worry about things like racking and stacking hardware. They don't need to worry about cooling and negotiating with governments uh, to, to expand to a new, new geography. Uh, our mission at AWS is to eliminate that undifferentiated heavy lifting so that you can focus instead uh, on your applications, on your users, on your, your core competitive advantage. And sixth, sixthly, I, I alluded to this earlier, with a, a few clicks of the mouse, you can go global. So uh, if, if, if anybody on the call has, has any experience with opening up a new data center in a new country, you, you know how painful and how time consuming that can be. Um, with, with Amazon and with, uh, for example, Elastic MapReduce, you can have a cluster in U.S. East and replicate that cluster in Japan in a few clicks. And it, it's one of the reasons that, uh, that we're, we're seeing so many customers moving on to AWS. So now let's talk a little bit about Elastic MapReduce, or EMR. Um, EMR is meant to make it easy to run Hadoop on AWS. And Hadoop, of course, is an open source framework for parallel processing very large amounts of data across a cluster of machines. Uh, in our case, that's a cluster of Amazon EC2 instances. Uh, EMR is, is, uh, was started in 2009, and since then we've been used by many thousands of customers. We've launched uh, over 5 million clusters. I, I believe that's the data point that we shared uh, earlier this year. It, the number is now significantly more than 5 million. Uh, and as you can see from some of the, the customers on the slide, they really span a wide range of, of industries and verticals. So to give you a couple of examples, in the media space and advertising space, we see uh, organizations correlating ad impression logs with clickstream data to deliver uh, better and more relevant advertising. In the retail space, we have companies like uh, Amazon.com uh, using EMR to power product recommendations. Um, in the life sciences space, there's a, a, a tremendous amount of genomics processing that's happening and other bioinformatics research. Um, and so, so the, the, the use cases are, are really quite varied, and in, 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 any, in, in, in any industry, uh, there's really a, a variety of things that you can be doing uh, with, with tools like EMR. So let's talk a little bit about how it works. Um, one simplistic model for how EMR works is, is as follows. So first, you upload your data and your processing application to Amazon S3, which is our storage service. Uh, you can write your application in, in Java. You can write it in Hive or Pig uh, or a variety of other languages. You then come to the Amazon EMR service, and you can use our SDKs, our API, our console, um, or a command line interface to configure uh, your cluster. So first, you would choose which, which region you want to launch your cluster in, for example, the US or Europe or Japan or Australia, 
Um, you then select the Hadoop distribution. We support four different distributions on EMR currently. You tell EMR how many instances or how many nodes you want to provision. Um, so you might want three nodes or you might want a thousand. Uh, just you, you make your selection. You also select what types of instances you want to use. So for example, if you're doing image processing, you might want to use high CPU instances. If you are running an HBase application, you might want to use a high I.O. or a cluster compute instance type. Um, and you make some other selections like around security and access and other, uh, other custom settings. Um, if you want to install additional applications, there's a very easy way to do that. Uh, you then tell EMR to launch your cluster. After the processing is complete, uh, the cluster will transfer the output back to Amazon S3 or whatever location you, you specify. Um, if you tell EMR to leave the cluster running, we'll leave it running and you can give it additional work. Otherwise, we'll automatically tear the cluster down uh, so that you stop paying for it. And just a quick note that if, uh, if you don't want to use S3 and you want to, for example, run a persistent uh, long-running cluster and just use HDFS, you can just write your data directly to HDFS and pull, pull it out when the job is done. One of the things that's unique about doing Hadoop in the cloud and using EMR is that you can easily resize your clusters. So this can be very useful if you have end-of-the-month processing, if you do batch processing at night, or you need more capacity at certain hours of the day than others. Uh, it's very easy to add instances to your cluster and then take them away when you no longer need them. Another thing that's very unique about EMR and EMR's architecture is that it allows you to leverage something called EC2 spot instances. Uh, and spot instances are essentially unused EC2 capacity that you place a bid price on. The spot market price changes every hour based on supply and demand. Uh, and by using spot instances, you can save 50% to 80% uh, off of the on-demand price for, for Amazon EC2. The catch with spot is that if the market price goes above your bid price, you'll lose those instances. Uh, so to accommodate that, EMR has a special architecture um, in which there is a certain class of slave node that does not run HDFS, the Hadoop Distributed File System. We call those task nodes, and they're ideal for spot because uh, you, if you lose the capacity, you do not lose your data on HDFS. So an EMR cluster essentially has three nodes, master node, core node that is running HDFS, and task node that is not. And uh, you can run all or, or part of your cluster on spot, but we find that many customers in production are using Spot in order to significantly sa to save a significant amount of money and also speed up their processing by a, a significant amount. Um, one of the other things that's a little unusual about EMR, and it takes it might take a moment to to to, to, under, to appreciate what what this uh, means for your processing, is that if you have your data in Amazon S3, you can launch multiple EMR clusters pointing to the same data set. So the, the reason I say this is a little unusual is that most of the time on-premise you have a single cluster, maybe you have one or two clusters, uh, and you, you kind of treat the cluster, you, you provision it for the, the lowest common denominator, and you have to tune your applications for the cluster that you have. Uh, in the EMR context, you provision clusters and you optimize them for a given application. So you might have one cluster that's optimized for CPU, another that's optimized for I.O., and you split your applications across the clusters, um, and that way your clusters are much more efficient, and you don't actually have to replicate the same data set across multiple clusters. You can use S3 as a single version of the truth. Uh, you can launch your entire cluster in an Amazon Virtual Private Cloud, which is a logically isolated section of the AWS network. Uh, we also have other tools to control access and permissions. And uh, finally, when you're done with a cluster, if you, if you transfer the output to Amazon S3, which is what many of our customers will do, you can terminate the cluster and stop paying for it. That way you, you continue to use Amazon S3 for storage and you use EMR and compute only when you truly need compute. So now I just want to talk for a, a minute or two about why do people use EMR and then, and then we're going to go over to uh, MicroStrategy. So, First of all, people use, uh, some of our customers use EMR because it's easy. You can launch a cluster in minutes. That could be a three-node cluster or it could be a thousand-node cluster. Um, it, is, it takes a, sing, a couple of clicks and if you know what you're doing and you, you know how you want to configure your cluster, you can launch a cluster in uh, probably 10 seconds or less. Uh, EMR handles node provisioning, Hadoop configuration, tuning, 
set up uh, all of those things so that you don't need to worry about managing Hadoop clusters and instead you can just focus on your data and your, uh, your analysis. Uh, secondly, because EMR is so elastic, you can easily match capacity to your, your required demand. Uh, that means that you're reducing waste, you're also reducing user dissatisfaction um, in, the, in the scenarios that you're not using your cluster fully or you're, you have more demand than your cluster can fulfill. Uh, thirdly, it's, it's low cost. So the fact that Amazon EMR is elastic is one of the reasons why it's low cost, but there's a few other reasons, including the, the actual price of EMR. Um, so for example, you can launch a 10-node EMR cluster for as little as 15 cents an hour. Um, you pay per node per hour, and the prices start at you know, one and a half cents per node. I, I mentioned earlier integration with EC2 spot instances. There's also integration with EC2 reserved instances. Um, and for, there's a variety of other features that I'm not commenting here on, on this slide that, that all together make EMR the most cost-effective solution for running Hadoop. Uh, if you Google Accenture Hadoop TCO or Accenture Hadoop study, uh, you'll find a study that Accenture put, uh, published just a few weeks ago comparing the total cost of ownership of EMR versus Hadoop on bare metal, uh, and they, they concluded pretty conclusively that EMR offers a superior price, to perf price performance than Hadoop on bare metal. Uh, next, EMR is reliable. So we have been tuning Hadoop for the cloud for uh, four years now. Um, we retry failed tasks. We, we replace poorly performing nodes. Uh, we do all of these things so that you don't need to, again, worry about your Hadoop clusters and you can focus on your analysis. Uh, EMR is secure. I commented on this earlier, so you can launch in a, in a virtual private cloud. We configure firewall settings. We give you tools to control access and permissions. And finally, uh, EMR is flexible. So although it is a managed service and we try to make things easy for you, we also give you complete control. So you have root, root access to every node. You can install additional applications. You can customize all of the default settings. Uh, and we support a variety of Hadoop distributions and applications so that you can use the tools that, that you prefer. Now I'm going to hand it over to Anurag, uh, who's going to talk to us a little bit about MicroStrategy. Thank you, John. This is Anurag Tandon. I'm uh, with MicroStrategy. I, I do uh, product marketing for big data and analytics. Uh, for those of you who might not know about MicroStrategy, uh, we're an independent vendor, public uh, company, uh, so we're the top BI vendor uh, with those particular criteria. We're, we're global in nature, and our customers span all industries. So um, the, the key thing to, to note here is we spend a lot in innovation because of our independent status, because of our public status. Um, we uh, prefer to call us, ourselves the Switzerland of BI because we, 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 we try to do everything in this particular space and since, since that's the sole focus that MicroStrategy has. So uh, in, in today's world, we see three ma major thrusts around BI and analytics self-service analytics, which is for business users to rapidly discover trends and insights from their data and see it visually so these trends, anomalies, you know, what have you, jump out, uh, jump out at the users right away. They don't need to learn um, you know, SQL. They don't need to code. They don't need to uh, do any complex um, you know, jiggering of the data to, to get to these insights. This, they're all available visually and interactively. Uh, in a very easy to use environment. The other um, trend that has been ongoing for years now, which is the production business intelligence. IT typically takes control of all of the reporting in an organization, and, and, and that still is, remains strong uh, to this day. And there's a lot of innovation that's happening in that area with, with newer, um, more and more packing of the data in the dashboards and the reports that, that are provided to, to users, mobile deployments, things of that nature. Um, and then there's big data analytics, obviously, which is the, the topic of today. Um, companies want to understand what to do with all of the data that they're collecting and uh, want, to, want to get more and more value out of it. Now, the, the truth is, no matter wherever the thrust comes for you, for your company, uh, or for your business unit or, or department, um, ultimately it's going to grow to encompass all three of these things. So if you started self-service analytics, ultimately you'll have to deploy that uh, from a production standpoint, operationalize the insights that you're going to get from data discovery to everybody in the organization. If you start from the big data side of things, you would want to do uh, visual dis discovery on it 
and ultimately, again, operationalize it um, for everybody. If you start in the, the core BI space, uh, business users would, would, would very quickly clamor to, to add more discovery type capabilities, being able to blend it with, with their own data, uh, and so on and so forth. So all three of these capabilities we see are key to any deployment, any business, any organization, uh, and, and we, we um, strive to provide all of those capabilities in one place, in one single place, and, and then a variety of options for you to uh, deploy this. So um, and it, we've been in the space for a long time. We have a, a variety of customers. We've solved uh, the, 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 the most complex challenges out there in, in the BI space as it relates to, uh, to large volumes of data. And, and the truth is, uh, at least in the media and uh, in the press, a lot of times what is referred to as big data deployments, big data applications, uh, end, end up being high volume applications. And obviously, there are new technologies with Hadoop and, and things like that on the back end to support these, these larger volumes and uh, the multi-structure nature of the big data. When it comes to the insights, when it comes to the analytics, uh, a lot of the, the things that are done for traditional BI and uh, for BI in the last few years uh, it remains true for, for big data as well. And, and we've led that space for, for quite a long time. Now, particularly when it comes to big data analytics applications, there are five main things we think are, um, you know, more required than, than, than in other BI initiatives. So there's definitely a much greater emphasis on data discovery, visual data discovery, over just standard reporting, because companies want to understand what insights the big data does contain before they actually roll it out to to large number of users. Uh, there's a stronger application of advanced and predictive analytics so that we can apply advanced statistics, advanced prediction and optimization algorithms against the largest amounts of data, the lowest level of data that, that um, our organization has. There is a greater necessity for combining data from multiple sources because not all data in, our, in an organization will live in a Hadoop cluster. It could but the reality is it, ne it usually doesn't happen that way. There's always um, going to be a need for combining sources, multiple sources of data. And there's a need for business users to get that in one place, have a, have a single view of all of their data and all of the capabilities there. And then there's obviously um, with, with uh, big data, there comes large variety of data as well as a a, a, um, as the large velocity. So there's semi-structured and unstructured data. You have to think, think about how to structure it and then do the analysis uh, on the structured portion of the data. Uh, what, uh, what is the, the data in the organization that does need to be structured? Uh, not everything might be useful uh, right away. And then um, you know, there might be streaming use cases as well. So with MicroStrategy, we're, we're providing capabilities and enriching capabilities to, to cover all of these grounds. And um, I'm going to talk about the first three for, for now, uh, given our short time, and starting with Visual Insight, which is the core product that we offer for visual data discovery. Um, it's all about visualizations. Stunning visualizations let insights jump out at you, um, provide you instant results to querying, ad hoc interactivity, and then be able to create effortless dashboards very, very quickly for business users. So rather than show it to you in a, a, a screenshot, um, I have a very, very quick demo uh, that I'm going to go through here that, that talks about uh, how, how business users might do visual data discovery. Now, I apologize for the resolution. Um, you can see more of these kinds of demos on our website. But this, uh, this particular demo talks about uh, loan data, and it's taking data for uh, different loans that are being given out to individuals with different credit ranges and of different credit grades. And um, with this particular data set, a business user can easily start to create many different visuals. Visual Insight will even give them options or recommendations for what visuals might work uh, for a particular uh, you know, set of data that, that, that uh, the business user wants to analyze. And then also bring in newer data into the mix. So the data we were looking at uh, was just loan data by different you know, grades and, and things like that. And if you didn't have geographical information, now this particular data set will bring in interest rates by state, um, what interest rates are being given for what loans in what states. 
And now with multiple data sets, you can kind of blend the data on the fly. You can, uh, you can create measures and metrics and KPIs that span uh, multiple sources and then start combining these different sources, these different data points into a single visual or a combination of visuals. So, uh, so you can see this data together and, and you can get some insights from it. Now for this particular uh, case, then, then you can rearrange these visuals however you want. Um, and, and since we brought in data for different states, it was geographical in nature, you can add things like maps um, and, and other kinds of interesting visuals for uh, business users to analyze the, the data quickly, but also represent it in the, in the most natural way possible for that particular data set. So here we're going to create a map and it kind of uh, shows you the average interest rates. You can color code them uh, by the different states. And if you, as you click on these different states, uh, the, uh, the, the, the tool provides you the capability to kind of filter the data on the fly on other visualizations to kind of link them all together. So uh, really in, in a couple of minutes, just wanted to give you guys a, a flavor for what visual data discovery is. And it kind of follows this, this workflow that works very well for business users. Uh, connect to any data, discover insights from it, create this, these very, very quick dashboards. Uh, they may not be completely IT uh, uh, published quality dashboards, but, but they're good enough for business users to kind of uh, start conversations and, and, and story tell from their, from their data. And then um, be able to provide it to IT to then create more published quality dashboards that then can also be shared through other devices and things of that nature. So, so that's, uh, that was number one capability of visual data discovery. Um, moving on to analytics, we strive to provide all analytics that organizations will need um, from the most basic to the most advanced projections, optimizations uh, that, that you might need for predictive and prescriptive analytics. And we provide that through not only native capability in the platform, we have 300 plus native functions that span all of these maturity levels, but then you can also integrate with other sources of analytics that you may have in your organization, like R uh, is an open source analytics tool. A lot of people use it. There are thousands of open source packages that, that companies have out there that can be integrated well in, in, with your data, SAS, Enterprise Miner, SPSS, KXN, so on and so forth. And so with MicroStrategy, your thousands of users can essentially be able to access all of those analytics that even a small group of data scientists are creating on the back end. And then being able to, prov to, to have data go from across all of the different sources in your environment, whether that is cloud-based data. Uh, we, we heard from uh, John about Amazon EMR. Uh, there's Amazon Redshift, which is another attractive database in the cloud. Uh, you may have other databases in your organization, whether on cloud or on premises, uh, and other personal sources. With MicroStrategy, you have the ability to bring in all of these sources, put together into a single view, and then be able to provide that to business users across many different devices. So having said that, how do you get started? Uh, there's a couple of ways I'm going to discuss here. There are many other ways uh, possible. But for, for those of you who don't have MicroStrategy today, and if you want to get started, very quickly with MicroStrategy Express, it is a software as a service application. Uh, you can go to, onto MicroStrategy and uh, our website and, and, and essentially just sign up for Express for free uh, and be able to access your, you know, upload data and, and visualize it, do visual discovery on it, or connect to data on premises, um, whether it's Hadoop data or, you know, Hadoop data in the, in the cloud, the DMR. Um, all of those ways are possible with MicroStrategy Express to be able to do visual data discovery. If you, go, if you want to go beyond visual data discovery, going into regular business intelligence, mobile deployments, uh, well, Express does mobile as well, uh, mobile deployments, or um, you know, sharing it across many different users, having it um, you know, f f for department or enterprise level, you can get started on the marketplace, on the AWS marketplace, where we have a free uh, 10 user, up to 10 user license of the entire platform available for anybody to, uh, to get started. We have an AMI, it's an Amazon machine image. You can just procure that uh, on an EC2 instance and it comes pre-installed with MicroStrategy software. Very easy to get started. So 
there are many ways possible. You can take on-premises microstrategy that you may have. If you're running into scalability issues, you can bring that into the AWS cloud um, like Netflix has done. Uh, and so there are many different ways possible. You can contact us for, uh, for more details. Uh, I don't want to bore you with all of the details here. And I want to give, you, give Albert, uh, uh, our guest speaker from Netflix, time to, uh, to go through his presentation. So um, off to you, Albert. Thanks, Anurag. Again, this is Albert Wong speaking. I'm in charge of the reporting platform at Netflix, and today we'll take a look at how we set up EMR, overview where it's used in our data platform, and go over how MicroStrategy plugs into this architecture. Lastly, we'll end with a demo illustrating how we get data from EMR into MicroStrategy. So for those of you who are new to Netflix, we are a TV movie content streaming business. When you log in, we display content that you can watch on demand. If you're a kid, we provide a section for kids' content next to the Watch Instantly link at the top. We also have a DVD service. Now, clicking on one of the shows below does two things. First, we stream the show to your device, whether it be a laptop, TV, or iPad to name its view. Second, we get to analyze data. Here, we have a simplified view of our data pipeline. Cloud apps, in this case, is Netflix.com. When you click on a piece of content to stream, we log that data into S3. And by the way, we do billions of these types of events per hour. Then we use our EMR clusters to process this data and save it back into S3 for analysis. We run two main clusters. The query cluster is open for running ad hoc jobs on demand, mostly for querying information. And we have a production cluster, which is reserved for stable, predictable jobs like ETL. And this is just one area of our data pipeline and a simplified view at that. This illustrates a more complete view of our data platform. At first glance, it may seem complicated, but it's actually quite easy to understand after taking some time to break it down. So let's break down the components of our data platform. This is our data platform back when we were only a DVD company. Oracle held information for our users, movies, TV shows, DV shipments, and financials. We would use Ab initio to transform that information into data structures in Teradata for reporting out of MicroStrategy. As we switched gears from a DVD to online video streaming business, we needed a place to store our growing data volume. And we ended up with S3, which stands for Simple Storage Service. It stores data reliably for a low cost, for us, it's basically an infinite hard drive. Okay, so what are we storing? For one, we store streaming events, like when you play, pause, resume, or stop a movie. These events get logged through our data um, event pipeline called HANU, which is a branch off of a similar technology called Chukwa conceived at Yahoo, and then modified to meet our needs. From Cassandra, we store our dimension data, for example, a movie or titles and user information. Cassandra is an open source distributed database with quick reads and writes, and we've replaced Oracle with it. To review, we have S3 being fed streaming event information from Hanu and dimension data from Cassandra. I've also drawn a squiggling line to separate our cloud technology from our data center systems. You'll notice that there's a processing step between Cassandra and S3. We'll detail what goes on there soon. Okay, moving on, we needed something to process our increased data volumes. So we use Hadoop for its framework in processing large data sets. Though a full discussion on how Hadoop works is out of scope for today, one thing I want to highlight is that it's designed to scale. So if we need to process more data quickly, we can just add more machines to the cluster. Next, we have TIG and Python. TIG is a high-level platform that uses the task of writing MapReduce programs to run in Hadoop. Python is a high-level programming language that helps us manipulate and transform data. And together, much of the ETL in the cloud can be done using TIG and Python. Next, we have Hive, uh, which, like TIG, provides an abstraction for creating MapReduce programs. The language it uses Hive QL resembles SQL, 
and we use it for ad hoc querying and data summarization. Putting it all together, we have Pig and Python executing in Hadoop to bring Cassandra data into S3. Event data flows through HANA into, into S3. We then use Python, Hive, and Pig running in Hadoop to process and summarize the data back into S3. Finally, we have a pipeline to bring our process data down into Teradata, where we can do reporting in MicroStrategy. In certain cases, we'll also push information from Teradata up into S3. At this point, it should be clear that S3 is our main data hub, where we store all our information. All we've done is introduce this, two new data sources, and technology to process and move all this information around. Fortunately for us, some of this data movement can be avoided. MicroStrategy provides the capability to connect directly to cloud data. We simply spun up a Hive uh, server in EMR, connected MicroStrategy to it, and then created reports hitting it like it were any other data source. And with that, we'll jump into a quick demo to illustrate this. Seems like my screen share is not working, so um, in the interest of time, um, I'll just um, end it here. Thanks. Just give us one minute. We're going to see if we can get the demo to work. Uh, just hold on for, for one, moment. one minute, please. Okay, it looks like we're back online. So going back to my demo, I am looking at a piece of HiSQL code. As you can see, it resembles SQL like I mentioned earlier. We have a select statement. We're pulling date, hour, and we're counting distinct customer IDs, and we're aliasing that as signups. We're pulling that from this table. We're also adding filters to this query. We're filtering to a specific country. We're taking away tester information. We are filtering on specific date ranges, and we're grouping by date and hour. So what I'm going to do now is just copy and paste this query, uh, fire up MicroStrategy's desktop interface, and then I'm going to go create a report. So here I'm just going to choose my high data source, click OK. Input my code, find the metadata below, 
you have the columns data types. Click OK. And then from there, we can execute this code. Now, I'm not actually connected to my corp network. But I've run this query not too long ago. And luckily for me, <clears throat> MicroStrategy has saved this information. And here's my report visualized into a bar graph. <clears throat> now, it took five minutes to execute a relatively simple query. What returned was 168 rows. So clearly, it's not something that we want to replace Teradata with. However, for those times when we need to report on data as it comes in before it's fully processed, not needing to set up a one-off workflow from HANU to S3 to Teradata, then scheduled through another scheduling tool, was a huge time saver. Well, that concludes my portion of the talk. Thanks for listening. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you all for your presentation on big data visual analytics with MicroStrategy and Amazon EMR. Let's open it up for a Q&A. Uh, I would like to start with um, Anurag. Maybe you can uh, start with a few questions that you most commonly get with your, from your customers, and that will get the thoughts flowing. Okay. Um, so uh, most commonly, you know, what we what we um, uh, hear from customers is, uh, in, in terms of visual data discovery, you know, how, how much data can you analyze, how much, um, you know, what, what are the different visualizations and who can do it. Um, and we find, we find many customers, you know, analyzing, you know, hundreds of gigabytes of data in memory um, because with MicroStrategy you're, you're able to, you know, at least get a lot of that data from wherever it lives combine it, um, you know, have a, create, a, create a central view of that data, provide it um, into an in-memory cube, load it up into an in-memory cube in MicroStrategy, and then be able to analyze it uh, from a visual standpoint. So, so when it comes to big data analytics, even though you're storing petabytes of information in, in, in Hadoop clusters, um, a lot of times um, not all of that lowest level of detail is necessary. To, uh, for, for the analysis to happen. But you do want to be able to analyze, maybe, you know, maybe roll it up a couple of levels uh, and instead of going to, this, you know, uh, to, to, to the lowest level of detail, you know, roll it up to like the, maybe the 10,000 foot level or something like that and, and, and analyze it in, um, in, in, in visual ways. That's you know, very, very um, easy and uh, you know, possible in, in, uh, to do in microstrategy. So, so we hear that a lot in terms of you know, how, do, how does visual data discovery go against uh, Hadoop, which is huge amounts of data. It may not work as quickly as we want, but, si but still visual data discovery is all about interactive access and, and suite of thought access. Oh, thank you, Anurag. Here's one more question. How do I connect MicroStrategy to an EMR cluster? Okay. Um, so uh, the EMR essentially is, is uh, another data source for MicroStrategy. So what we use to connect to EMR is Hive. So similar to what Albert was showing, um, they have a Hive server in place uh, in, uh, in EC2. And what MicroStrategy has is, is connectors to Hive. Essentially, we use, use Hive, um, Hive ODBC drivers. And to MicroStrategy, it looks uh, just like another database source because we write SQL, and um, Hive will translate that SQL or HiveQL, whatever you want to call it, into MapReduce that then goes into Hadoop and, and uh, analyzes and, and uh, processes uh, the data on the fly. Thank you, Anurag. I'm going to ask one more question to you. Um, why are you using Cassandra versus another database? 
I think that's probably more appropriate for Albert to answer. Oh, sure. sure. Albert, would you like to take that? Sure. So, uh, as I mentioned earlier, our data volume was growing, and uh, we just needed something that was more scalable. And we chose Cassandra because it was distributed, it was in the cloud, and it handled reads and writes fairly quickly. Thank you, Albert. And I would like to remind our audience that they can use the Q&A widget in their browser to enter more questions. Um, here's one question for you, um, Anurag. How big is the data that, oh, I'm sorry, that's for Albert. How big is the data that Netflix regularly processes? Um, so we handle billions of events per hour. Um, and so we have terabytes of information coming every day. Um, one more question to you, Albert. What kind of visualization are you providing? We do a lot of trending charts, so a lot of line graphs, um, and we do comparisons using bar charts. Um, so it's very um, uh, simple visualizations that we use. Um, we haven't used uh, some of the advanced widgets in, um, in, that Visual Insight provides, uh, but we've used it for um, ad hoc analysis. We just don't really uh, publish that information uh, too often. Albert, do you want to comment uh, on uh, how many users uh, does Netflix have that are accessing Hadoop in this interactive fashion? And uh, are there plans for growing that, or you know, what you know from an organization standpoint, how many how many users access that? Uh, we have a fair percentage of our company using Hadoop. Um, our, our data science department is about 100 people uh, and growing, and and so roughly 10 to 20 percent of the company actually uh, accesses our systems. Thank you. Um, Actually, I'm, I'm noticing that we're experiencing a problem with the Q&A widget. If some of you are unable to enter questions, that's why. I apologize for that. Uh, here's, I have a question here uh, for MicroStrategy. Is MicroStrategy used more for ad hoc analysis, visualization, or dashboarding? Um, so it used to be that at least a few years ago, but even before dashboards became more mainstream, that we were used a lot for ad hoc analysis from a reporting standpoint. Um, so it was more OLAP uh, analysis, but, but done more, uh, mainly on reports, so mainly on, on uh, uh, numbers and things like that, but not necessarily as much, as much visual analysis. Um, but a few years ago, dashboards took hold as, as, um, as, as, a, as a very uh, forceful trend. Uh, it was coming from the C-suite that you know, people uh, wanted, wanted these dashboards, and these dashboards were interactive, had a lot of data, um, and, and, and so to the, to the extent where some of the use cases that executives and high-level business users want, um, there was enough data that you could pack in the, into the dashboards to do interactive uh, analysis, even though it wasn't true ad hoc. Um, and so that's where I see most of our customers at is in this dashboarding and reporting uh, frame of mind. Uh, especially when it comes to to uh, business intelligence, production business intelligence. Uh, but visual data discovery is is very hard these days. It's coming up more and more. Business users want even you know more and more control over the types of analysis that they want to conduct. It's not necessary that they have the time to provide all of those requirements up front for IT to create the reporting for them. Um, and just like Albert said, you know they want to do analysis on their EMR cluster and on the, on the, through Hive bef rather than having ETL processes feed all of that data into, your, into their Teradata uh, system. And so given that, we're going to see even more trends of business users taking control over the analysis and, and, and doing it themselves and asking for more and more features to support that. I, I, uh, this is John. I have a quick question that, that has also come in around, and I, I think the question is for 
uh, Albert. Um, Albert, how do you deal with uh, security in the cloud, and what are the tools that, that you guys are using um, to control access to your clusters to, to make sure that the data is secure? Sure. We're actually uh, a pretty open culture company, so uh, almost all of our users have access to everything in the cloud. Uh, what we do control is SOX information, and there's been a process put in place just recently to secure that information. Um, I won't go over the details and, and how that works, um, particularly because uh, I don't actually know. But, um, but um, r uh, right now, um, all of the, um, the streaming information that I outlined, uh, all the Cassandra data, uh, that's open to all our employees. Thank you very much. And uh, we apologize for those of you who were not able to answer your questions. I hope the questions that we covered answered some of the pending questions you had. Uh, we will reach out to via email. Uh, and if you, if you like, you can contact MicroStrategy and AWS uh, in the contact information on your screen. Thank you very much for our presenters. Uh, Anurag Tandon from MicroStrategy, Albert Wong from Netflix, and John Einkoff from AWS. And to our presenters, thank you for taking the time, and we apologize for the technical difficulties some of you have experienced. And um, please feel free to um, take a little survey, let us know how we did so we can improve. And this concludes today's Amazon Web Services Partner webcast. Thank you very much. <laughs>